Our first Sunday brings the message through our beloved Reverend John Scott. We know him as John the Beloved. We know we're going to get an assignment. And so I invite you to open your hearts, open your consciousness, open your minds to the ideas that Reverend John will share this morning and to lift up your consciousness and your celebratory feeling with love and welcome, Reverend John Scott, to share the message this morning. Thank you, Sandy. Good morning, friends. What a rain. Joy to add my own words of welcome um, and to see that you are all out. I'll never forget one Sunday morning, it was raining as it was yesterday evening. And I have in, in my consciousness at the time the Jamaican race belief that when it rains, you stay home. So I phoned Dr. Elmer Lumsden, our beloved founding minister, and said, Dr. Elmer, the place is washing away. We're not having any church. And she said, is the temple still there, dear? <laughs> I said, uh, 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 yes, Reverend Elmer. She said, then come for me. You know, the rain stopped just long enough for her to get into my car. I got out to help her in, and it didn't wait for me to get back in. So it drenched me, but she was dry. And when we got under the pork share there, she opened her bag and handed me a towel. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I said, dry up yourself, my dear, and we'll be on the podium at 9 o'clock. So here we are on the podium at 9 o'clock. Welcome. And welcome to those who are listening to us on the World Wide Web. So the torrents of water that fell yesterday, breaking the long drought that we have been experiencing in beautiful Jamaica, set me to thinking about the miracle of abundance. Thinking about the inexhaustible, invisible substance that is capable of manifesting itself in form and shape to satisfy our every requirement and our every desire in life. And so my encouragement, as I call my Sunday morning um, talks, uh, is entitled, The Miracle of Abundance. It's been a long time since I've seen so much rain. Consider for a moment when the rain starts to fall. The air is filled with drops of water that in a flash can flood the land and rage in torrents in the streets. Where was the water moments before the rains came? Of course, we know it was present all the time in the form of unprecipitated moisture in the atmosphere. But before our very eyes, the invisible becomes visible. A miracle? No, not at all a perfectly normal phenomenon with an explanation that any of our temple kids could give us. The Gospels of Jesus contain some amazing and almost unbelievable evidence of the miracle of abundance. There was a miraculous demonstration of food to feed 5,000 hungry followers. There was a tremendous catch of fish that came after Jesus bade the disciples to drop their nets on the right side of the boat. And when you read the Bible, you have to read it for the symbolism. Note, drop your net, let down your nets on the right side, meaning the proper side. They'd obviously been fishing on the wrong side. And as to getting money out of the mouth of a fish, you're right. So what is a miracle? In this orderly universe that is regulated by changeless law, it is inconceivable to me that natural law can be abrogated, my friends. We use the word supernatural, but what do we really mean by that? The supernatural of today becomes the superbly natural of tomorrow. Today, we all accept the scientific, ex ex the scientific explanation of an eclipse, yet until comparatively recently in human history, an eclipse was regarded as a supernatural phenomenon that struck fair into the heart of uninformed people. There is no supernatural. There is only God's great natural. There is no miracle. There is only the ever-present possibility of laying hold of divine law on higher and higher levels of understanding and expression. The important lesson in the miracle stories in the Bible is that we live in a universe that is opulent, limitless, and absolutely accommodating. 
It will manifest for us exactly what we have the consciousness to encompass. There is a legitimate royal abundance available for every living soul. We live and move, my friends, and have our being in that abundance. But it may be non-material, spiritual substance. In other words, it may be an energy potential that requires mental and material precipitation. The miracle of abundance is not therefore the multiplication of loaves of bread, nor the drawing of a mammoth catch of fish. The real miracle I want you to contemplate this morning is the all sufficiency and ever availability of infinite substance. It is all sufficient and it is ever available to you. This is why Jesus taught that the kingdom of heaven is an opulent kingdom of substance and that the supply to meet our demands is right where we are. He taught us too that we should not hesitate to ask and ask largely. In Matthew 7, verse 7 and 8, he says, and I quote, ask and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. End of that scripture. So you see, friends, God can give much as easily as it can give little. It takes no more effort for the law of mathematics to add 2 million and 2 million to get 4 million than to add 2 plus 2 to get 4. At this very moment, if every man, woman, and child in Jamaica took a piece of paper and a pencil and wrote down the problem 2 plus 2 equals 4, there would be no strain placed on the principle of mathematics simply because it is just that, a principle. There is no more substance in a million dollars than in 10 cents, for there is no quantity in spirit. If someone asks you, what is a million dollars? You have to resort to quantity to answer the question. You say, well, um, it's six zeros after one. Or you think, large quantities of bills. Or you respond, the money to buy lots of things. But you know what, friends? It is substance that has been formed and shaped into a quantity. But the quantity itself is in our mind. We named the million a million. We could have called it a penny. And we could have called a penny, or a one cent, 10 cents, a million. The perceiving power of the mind and the ability to form and shape substance is really the basis of what we call faith. Looking at it this way, the miracle of the loaves and fishes becomes more credible. Because here comes a boy with five loaves and two fishes. They represent a formation of substance. There is not enough food in his lunch pan to feed 5,000 people, but there is enough substance here. For there is no quantity in substance. If you think of the boy's lunch in terms of the crystallization of substance into bread and fish, there is not enough. Think of it instead as an evidence or focal point of limitless spirit substance, and what you get is abundance. So when you handle money this week, don't think of it as the quantum in your hand. Think of it as evidence of God's all-providing limitless substance. Do you remember what Jesus did when he took the five loaves and two fishes? Anybody? First, first, he looked into heaven. That did not mean that he looked up into the blue skies above him. He looked into the heaven of his consciousness and then he gave thanks, which is an indication that we need to look up into the heaven of our belief system, into the heaven of our consciousness, and look at our attitudes to that 
crystallized evidence of substance, which we call money. So looking up into heaven means looking away from the appearances of lack and giving thanks for abundance. He blessed what he had, for it was substance. Now there is a lesson for us, to bless what we have. The power of blessing is not reserved for holy places and for specially ordained persons. It is an act of tremendous possibilities that should be developed by everyone. Blessing is an attitude of mind which enables us to see the mango tree within the mango seed. It is an attitude of mind that allows us to see the divinity in the homeless person or the prisoner. It is the attitude of mind that allows us to see the great leader of men in the newborn infant. And so this brings me to your assignment. Your mission this week, should you decide to undertake it, is to remind yourself all this week of the law stated in Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Let me quote it. It is your father's good pleasure to do what? To give you the kingdom. Let us own this for ourselves right now by affirming it's the Father's good pleasure to give me the kingdom. It's good pleasure. I'm not convinced you sound very fanky fanky. Let me hear it. It's the Father's good pleasure to give me the kingdom. Now, know it for your neighbor, turn to him or her and say, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, let's say, I accept it. I deserve it. And then say with me, mine is the kingdom and the power and the glory right now, today, and forever. Mine is the kingdom and the power and the glory right now, today, and forever. Now this week when you say the Lord's Prayer, when you get to, for thine is the kingdom, add, and mine. So you will say, for thine and mine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. So you mustn't be afraid to claim your divine birthright. Let us say, for thine and mine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. For thine and mine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. When? No. For how long? Forever and ever. In addition, my friends, every time you handle money this week, every time you write a check, hopefully to the Temple of Light Center for Spirituality, <laughs> or use your debit card or credit card, I want you to silently affirm, Father, I do thank thee for the miracle of abundance in my life. Father, I do thank you for the miracle of abundance in my life. I remember when Dr. Elmer, our founder, ordered these chairs that you're sitting on for the sanctuary. Someone said, Dr. Elmer, where is the money to come from? She said, I don't know, dear, from wherever it is in the universe. <laughs> you know, friends, our intellect the skeptical part of our nature is so often a block to our good. We say, after all, we must be practical. If 5,000 people are at Emancipation Park in Kingston and all they have on hand is five cocoa bread and two sprats, the people are not going to get fed. End of story, Jack Mandori. I have read where some cynics have said that what really happened was that when the little boy gave up his lunch so, so selfishly in that story about Jesus, and so willingly, the others who were selfishly hoarding their lunches were inspired to share theirs, are still a miracle, so to speak. Another scholar, Dr. George Lamser, suggests that the real miracle was the timely arrival of a camel train laden with food sent by a thoughtful merchant in the nearest town. A still a miracle. That's where the 12 baskets came from that they were able to put the scraps in. But my friends, all that really matters is that the people were fed. The miracle of abundance is not the manner in which substance manifests in your life, but the ever availability of substance to meet your needs. The word substance 
comes from the Latin sub, meaning under, and stare, meaning to stand. Substare. So standing under your every desire is the rich, opulent, and limitless stuff from which all creation comes. You have at your disposal the same undifferentiated substance that Jesus utilized to demonstrate abundance. The real miracle working power that can do what Jesus did is your faith. It is what you believe is possible in your life and in your circumstances. Faith is the ability to look beyond appearances as Jesus did and to perceive the substance, the, the, the just abundance of God's good that is standing under every single thing that he required for his ministry. And it's the ability to draw forth that substance, to form it and shape it into what we desire. There's a wonderful story uh, told by early New Thought author Eric Butterworth, which illustrates the power of this kind of faith. Butterworth tells a story of a man called George Mueller, who was the director of an orphanage in Bristol, England. This large orphanage operated for years without fundraising drives or appeals. Money always came unsolicited at the time it was needed. Well, one evening, an assistant director came to George Mueller an hour before supper time saying, sir, there's no bread for supper. Mr. Mueller replied, have no fear, there will be bread. Half an hour later, the anxious assistant came back saying, uh, Mr. Mueller, there is still no bread for supper, and it's time to have the children get ready. Again, the answer, there will be bread. Have the children get ready as usual. And I read it, I thought, you remember when we were children, you used to have to bathe and tidy before. That's a, a uniquely Caribbean thing. You bathe and tidy before supper, right? Well, she said, have the children get ready. The children filed into the dining room and stood at their places as the frantic assistant director cried, but Mr. Mula, where is the bread? What will we do? There is no bread. Calmly, the director said, there will be bread. Have them, say grace. Almost as soon as the children chorused their amen, there was the clatter of trucks roaring up the drive with bread. bread. Just about an hour before, the owner of a bakery in Bristol had an inspiration. He was having an over a glut of bread. They had made too many loaves. And he suddenly had the inspiration about an hour before that he, should, he could take the excess bread to the children's orphanage and feed Mr. Mueller's children. As much of a miracle, I dare say, as if a few loaves were multiplied at the orphanage tables. There is an interesting sequel to this story of the orphanage, too, and a bit harsh, I think. Mr. Mueller called the assistant director to his office and informed him that he was being dismissed. He said, and I quote, I can't afford to have in my employ someone who will doubt God three times in one hour, <laughs> unquote. I wonder, my friends, how often you open your wallets and say, all I have is, I only have so and so. What am I going to do? The rent is due, the whatever it is. I need repairs on my car, and all I have is. Am I right, or am I right? Sometimes in the prosperity class when I teach tithing, and I say, you know, nobody really understands the miracle of tithing. And I said, I understand what a big frog it is to swallow. Because if you have $100 that has come to you and you owe, you have to pay out 200 for something, it's a big frog to take out $10 out of the 100 But when you do, believe me, the 90 goes farther than the 100 would have. Don't ask me how, but money just appears to fill the need when you are a regular tither. I, don't, I never have tithers who come to me and say, I have a cash flow problem. 
And it's really funny. I've had a few people come and say, you know, I need you to pray with me for abundance. And I said, ah, you're tithing. I don't really believe in it. <laughs> Done unto you as you believe. So St. Paul says it, for me, why, says it for me very well. He says, and I quote, stir up the gift of God that is in you. Stir up the gift of God that is in, in you. When you need, when you stir up this gift, it's the gift of your faith that you're stirring up. Believe that all of the substance of the universe is available to you. It is not withheld. Let the rain last night remind you, no fight day. All you need to do is to claim it for yourself. Faith then is what we are going to use to demonstrate the abundance that we require. Stir it up and believe that as a spiritual unity, you are in you, as a spiritual person, you are in unity with the whole. Believe that your mind is a channel through which great ideas always flow and that we can find the substance of God, first in the form of guidance and the creative skills of our hands, and second of all, as the outward manifestation of the means of exchange. The money to do what needs to be done is available. Claim it for yourself. The place to, to overcome lack, unemployment, financial hardship, and poverty is in the general attitudes of our own consciousness. Our job as practitioners of the science of mind is to stir up the gift of faith, to individually and collectively live from the recognition of the omnipresent substance and put our faith in it. When we do this, we will begin to see others around us doing the same. For to use the same metaphor of, of bread, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, and I quote, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, unquote. Just a drop of that faith can leaven the entire lump of dough to make it rise into the magnificence that you require to live your life as a son and daughter of the living spirit almighty. That this means that every time you bear witness to the truth by demonstrating the prosperity law, you raise the consciousness of this community, the community you live in, and indeed of the entire island. Friends, it is truly a sin, or if you prefer, an error, to be poor. God never intended it. Thoughts of lack and limitation degrade and depress and pull you down, while thoughts of absolute abundance uplift and inspire and just make you feel so good about being in close contact with the, live, the, the living spirit. I believe that we in this center, by laying hold of the concept of the divinity in all people, by seeing ourselves and our fellow beings in the context of wholeness, and by demonstrating the miracle of abundance, are not only laying claim to our divine inheritance of abundance, we're being an uplifting influence for opulence in Jamaica, the Caribbean, and the entire world. Live richly as God's beloved. You are truly blessed with the miracle of abundance. When you handle money, look up, as Jesus did, into the heaven of your consciousness and bless it in the knowledge that it is limitless. And above all, remember that thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Namaste. <laughs>